And that's how he reveals to him. And he reinstates the promise to Abraham, saying, no, in fact, you will have a son through Sarah. And he binds this covenant through the act of circumcision. Abraham gets circumcised, then Ishmael gets circumcised, then the whole household gets circumcised. But it's this outward demonstration of them cutting away the flesh that Abraham is no longer going to mess around, but he's going to take God seriously. He's going to take God at his word. That he's not going to walk according to the flesh, but he's going to wait upon the Lord and now walk according to the Spirit. So as we get into verse 18, I mean chapter 18 here in verse 1, we see again that the Lord's going to appear to him in a powerful way. It says in verse 1, then the Lord appeared to him. And, and, and that's exactly what happens when we cut away the flesh. As Abraham cut away the flesh at the end of chapter 17, God is able to reveal himself to us. You see, silence will follow disobedience in our lives, but revelation will follow obedience in our lives. And now we see Abraham being obedient. He sees, he, he sees, God sees Abraham cutting away the flesh. Well, okay, he isn't messing around now. And he's able to speak to Abraham now. And he's not going to walk according to the flesh, but again, according to the spirit. But So that's something that you and I need to do. We need to cut away the flesh, and that's something we need to repent of and say, Lord, I, I don't want to walk according to the flesh and take matters into my own hands, but I'm going to choose to follow you. I'm going to choose to follow you, and then God will reveal himself to you in one of the most powerful ways. So it says, And the Lord appeared to him by the terrific trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. And, and so here's Abraham laying in his tent in the heat of the day, we have to understand that those people that lived in the desert area, uh, it was too hot to work during the day. I'm sure Neil can relate to this. You're going to want to wake up early before the sun is too hot to get what you have to get done. Yep. And then maybe after the sun starts to settle down and it's, it's getting a little cooler in the evening, you can go back out and work again. That's exactly what Abraham did. But he's in his tent during the heat of the day, and the Lord appears to him. And I want you to note that, because it's not what Abraham's out serving it's not when he's out working. It's not when he's out planning and doing all these things, all distracted. It's when he's simply resting that the Lord appears to him. And guess what? God wants to appear to you. God wants to visit you. God wants to reveal himself to you. But it only takes place when you are simply resting in him, that you can hear from him. So in verse 2, it says, So he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, three men... And we're going to see that these three men, I'm just going to give you a spoiler alert. These three men is the Lord Jesus himself, accompanied by two angels, and we'll get to that in a moment. But behold, three men were standing by him, and when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and he bowed himself to the ground. So, that word behold in that verse, it says behold three men, it, 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 it describes to us some abruptness. That these angels and the Lord just appeared. Again, Abraham is in the plains of Mamre, where you can look out and see miles in every direction. Abraham would have had the opportunity to see men walking for quite some time before they got to his camp. But he didn't. Instead, they just, behold, they just showed up, just divinely and supernaturally. And it tells us that Abraham, this 99-year-old man, runs, he sprints, and he just falls and he bows himself. And that in the Hebrew means he worshipped. He worshipped the Lord. Are you enthusiastic like the Lord tonight, how Abraham is? He sees the opportunity to worship God, and he runs. He doesn't look back, he doesn't drag his feet, but he runs, and he drops before the Lord. You see, when we come here tonight, we need to be enthusiastic about God. When we come here on Sunday mornings, we need to be enthusiastic about God, because we are meeting with God. You guys aren't coming here to meet with me. You're coming here to meet with God, and that is huge. That is no small thing. And Abraham was so enthusiastic about that. Wow, the Lord, there's an opportunity. And he runs and he bows himself and he worships. So in verse 3, so after he fell to the ground, it says, he said, My Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. And so here he addresses him as Lord, as Adonai, my Lord. If I have found favor, if I have found grace in your sight, if grace is upon me, Abraham says, please don't pass by me. He says, I want to fellowship with you, Lord. I want to spend time with you. I want to commune with you, God. Will you stay here? Please don't pass on by me. Stay here. Stay here, Lord. Stay here with me that I may know you. So in verse 4, it says, please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your hearts. 
After that, you may pass by inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. So here, you have to picture this. Here's Jehovah God coming before Abraham. And Abraham just wants to bless his heart. He just wants to serve him. He just simply wants to be with him. He says, I want to wash your feet. He says, I want to get you a morsel of bread. I just want to be with you. I just want to be with you, God. You guys want to be with God. And you look at it, just see his heart in this. And, and, and it's just so immediate. And, and, and he just wants to do everything he can do for the Lord. You know, it reminds me of what ministry should be like. This is what ministry should be like. And you have to understand the story of Mary in the New Testament. Where she has that expensive alabaster flask and she breaks it and she pours it upon Jesus. She just wants to bless his heart. She just wants to be with him. She just wants to spend time with him. What about Jesus when he took the position of a servant and began to wash the disciples' feet? This is who Abraham is. He was that kind of man. He wanted to extend hospitality. And this is the first like prototype, the first example of what it is to extend hospitality. And at this point in time, Abraham doesn't really know if this is the Lord. There, there's no proof of that at this moment that he knows this is God. To him, for all he knows, it's a stranger. But it, there's that verse out there, right? Entertain strangers, but you might be entertaining an angel. And here he is, just extending hospitality. And, and it's just a wonderful picture of what's going on. But as we get into verse 6, it says, So Abraham hurried into the tents to Sarah and said, Quickly, make ready three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes. And I just think marriage is so funny. I mean, here's an Abraham just goes up the door. Hey, babe, I need you to whip me up some cakes. You know, we have some unexpected guests. We have, you know, the CEO, the president, the vice president, they're all here. Make some cakes, please. And you, and I know you guys know what it's like. You know, sometimes husbands are stubborn. Sometimes they invite people over on an ounce, and, you know, you have to hear from your wife later. But listen, and, and some, something like this would add friction within the home. But I, I, I think their marriage is marvelous because if we were to look at 1 Peter chapter 3, we get some insight on their relationship with Abraham and, and Sarah together. It says in verse 5, it says, For in this manner in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. You see, when, when Abraham just came storming in and said, Make us some cakes, Sarah could have flipped out and <laughs> said, What? You didn't consult me first, you just have these people coming over, you know, what are you doing, Abraham? But instead, despite whether she had a rough and tough day, despite whether, you know, she was consulted first, she she's kind of submitted herself and her husband said, okay. And, and, and the scriptures here tell us that because she's doing this, she's considered a holy woman. She was one that knew the Lord. She was God-fearing, and she was holy, and she was submitting to the Lord by submitting to her husband. And they just had that relationship. And I think that's such a beautiful relationship despite the circumstances of just, uh, you know, and maybe it was inconvenient for her. But rather she just said, okay, you know, I'll talk to you later about this. But, you know, okay, I'll do that for you. I'll send hospitality to these people. Again, she doesn't even know it's the Lord either at this point. For all she knows, it's strangers. So, it says in verse 7, And Abraham ran to the herd, took a tender and good calf, Gave it to a young man, and he hastened and prepared it. So he took butter and milk in the calf, which he had prepared. And I want you to know that those three things, butter, milk, and calf, in Jewish culture, that would be considered unkosher. You weren't supposed to mix two of something of the cow, right? The, the, you can't have cheeseburgers and stuff like that. But this was before the Levitical law was in process, so this was acceptable. So he has the butter, the milk, the calf, which he had prepared. And he set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree as they ate. I really, I think this scene is so remarkable. Here's Jehovah God again, the creator of the universe, created everything. And he's invited into Abraham's tent. And again, Abraham serves him without delay. Immediately just serves him, runs after him. And he knows that God deserves the best. He doesn't find some roadkill in the desert. He doesn't find some sloppy seconds. He gives him the most best and tender calf. And he dices it up for him. He deserves the best. But this scene is really amazing. You see, 
It is very cultural. Because at the end of verse 8, it says that as Jehovah, or God, was eating, he took by them, he stood by them under the tree as they ate. You see, if, if you go to Israel today, or even in some Middle Eastern countries out there, when they invite you into their tent, they are highly considering you under their hospitality. They don't take a lightly. It's very, very serious. They're big on hospitality. So if you go into their tent, what they're first going to do is offer you a bitter cup of tea. And it's all symbolic, by the way, but they drink the tea because they want you to remember and wash away all your bitter experiences that you had in life, that you will be mindfully present and be a part of the joyful conversations that are going to take place within the tent. And after you drink that bitter cup of tea, they were going to give you a sweet, hot, strong cup of coffee. And again, it's all symbolic, but when you drink it, it's for them to say, I, I hope that your time here is going to be blessed and it's going to be sweet. And so after you have the tea, after you have the, the cup of coffee, they serve you this enormous meal. But they don't partake. They stand by and they watch you eat. And you just eat and eat and eat until you pass out. And, and, and they delight in you being a glutton. They actually they rejoice when you belch. They're like, wow, okay. And they, they like to see you happy and satisfied. But they're standing by the whole time, just ready to be a servant, ready to do whatever they're asked of next. And that's exactly what Abraham's doing here, just standing here waiting for the Lord to give him further instruction. But after that meal, they'll then present to you another cup of coffee. And now there's a difference, though. They're either going to pass that cup of coffee with their right hand, or they'll pass it with their left hand. If they pass it with their right hand, it means that they want you to stay. But if they pass it to you with their left hand, it means, well, after dinner, dinner's over, you, know, you finish this cup of coffee, you're out of here. Sorry, adios. Like, I don't want anything more to do with it. But if you receive the first cup of coffee with your right hand, they will then extend a second cup of coffee to you. And I know this is a lot of coffee, it's like three cups at this point. But they give you a third cup with their right hand. And what that means is they want you to stay as long as you want, months, years. That you are now under their hospitality. That it's the sacred trust that's going on. So again, this is super cultural what we're seeing here. And it's going all the way back to Abraham. And Abraham's just standing there as Jehovah God is eating. And again, here he's, he's in the, the likeness of a man. Grease on his fingers, crumbs in his beard. Big smile on his face, just eating. And God does this again in the New Testament. When he's eating with sinners and tax collectors, and the Pharisees walk by and say, Jesus, what are you doing eating with sinners and tax collectors? That is no representation of Jehovah. God would never do such a thing. That's not true. Look at this. In Genesis 18, God stoops down and eats with Abraham. It's beautiful. So in verse 9, it says, Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? Again, there's no mention of Hagar. It doesn't say, where is Hagar, your wife? It says, where is Sarah, your wife? But that is part of the covenant plan. And Abraham responded, well, here, in the tent. And God said, I will, sh I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Now Sarah was listening in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. And Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. So, I just love this scene. Here, here is Abraham in the tent with God and two other angels. At this point, they're still strangers. And I want to, I want to note that in chapter 17, God reinstated the promise of a son through Sarah to Abraham alone. But now it's being spoken again for not the sake of Abraham, but for the sake of Sarah. God knows Sarah is listening. God knows Sarah is eavesdropping. And so he probably said it loud enough that Sarah would hear it. He said, hey, Abraham, where's your wife, Sarah? And Sarah said, ooh, what's going on? What about me? Says, you know that 90-year-old 90, that 90 woman? She's going to have a son, a baby boy. And she hears all of this. Now, it tells us in verse 12, therefore, Sarah laughed. And note this, within herself. Now, this isn't a laugh like Abraham had in the previous chapter. When Abraham heard the news that he and Sarah would bear a child, he laughed with astonishment, with excitement, with joy. Like, what? This is unbelievable. But here's Sarah laughing with disbelief. Like, pfft, what? You gotta be kidding. It's not even funny, Lord. What? That's not a possibility. That is not a possibility, God. But it says she laughed within herself. 
After I've grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? And th th that must have shocked Sarah. Again, she's eavesdropping, she's listening on the conversation, she laughs within her heart, no one hears it. And as, she, as God's talking to Abraham, if God says, why did Sarah laugh? And Sarah's like, hmm? I don't know. And that's probably when she knew it was God. That's when her faith probably began to increase. Because how else would anyone know that she laughed? Not some stranger, but God. Again, this was all for the sake of Sarah's faith to be increased. You see, Sarah thought this was a human impossibility, which it technically is, right? She was way past the age of childbearing. Uh, at this point, menopause is over, done with. Abraham's not looking too hot on his end either. But that's exactly where God wanted the situation. God wanted this humanly impossible apart from divine intervention. God may receive the glory. And that's exactly where he has them. And now we get into verse 14. To me, this is the most amazing question. One of the most amazing questions you can find in the Bible. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now, looking at Romans chapter 4, we would see that Sarah doubts she believes that things are too hard for the Lord, but Abraham did not believe that things are too hard for the Lord. It says in Romans chapter 4, verse 19, it says, In not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead, since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. And so this is exactly why Sarah's laughing. She's like, well, my husband's good as dead. My womb is good as dead. It's impossible. But now in regards to Abraham's faith, it goes on in verse 20 to say, He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he has promised, he was able to perform. So Abraham was fully convinced that what God had promised him, God was able to perform. Abraham believed that nothing was too hard for the Lord. Do you believe tonight that nothing is too hard for the Lord? Because I understand there are things in our lives that you and I are incapable of doing. We can try to accomplish things on our own, but we can only get so far before we fall short because we're limited. But God is omnipotent. God is all-powerful. God is El Shaddai. He can do anything. Nothing is too hard for him. But sometimes we have this tendency to attach our limitations to our idea of how big and powerful God is and we limit him. You know, Chuck Smith said, so many people say, oh, there's no problem praying for a headache over someone has leukemia. <laughs> You say, wow, Lord, it's a tough one. I don't think you can handle that. I don't think you can heal someone like that. I understand you being able to heal a headache. You know, you can pray for them, give them a Tylenol. But what are you going to do when it comes to cancer? What are you going to do? But it's, at the end of the day, nothing's too hard for the Lord. I don't care if it's a headache. I don't care if it's leukemia. I don't care if it's raising someone from the dead. God can do anything. Mm -hmm. And I want you to think tonight, is there anything in your life from a human standpoint that just cannot be fixed? Is there someone you know where their marriage is failing? Is there someone you know that is over their head in financial debt and, and you laugh within your heart with disbelief saying, the Lord can never fix that? It's impossible. I want you to know tonight that just as the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? He says to us, he says, why are you laughing at that? Have you forgotten who I am? You know, if you recall the story of Jesus coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, he runs into a father who has a demon-possessed boy. And the man falls to Jesus' feet. He says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. He says, Lord, I know you can. Lord, I know you're able, but help my disbelief. I get what it's like to not believe and have disbelief when it comes to certain things. But that is a powerful prayer. How do we Lord, I know you can. I know you're able. There's still that little spot in there. Just disbelief. And oftentimes, because we're attaching our limitations to our idea of who God is. 
But again, is that anything too hard for the Lord? No. At the appointed time, you know, Solomon tells us there is a time for every purpose under heaven. At the, at the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And God said, no, but you did laugh. I love how Sarah is so quiet the whole time. Just eavesdropping. And then she gets called out by the heart of God. And she blows her cover. And I did not laugh. What? What are you talking about? She just lied to the face of the living God. What did God do? Did God smoke her? Did God wipe her out and strike her dead for lying right to her, his face? No. God is a loving and a tender God. And he knew he knows her heart. He knows she's afraid. Just as he knew she laughed. God knows the hearts of all. There's nothing hidden. There's nothing hidden before the eyes of the Lord. He sees all things. They're all naked before him. There's nothing we can hide from him. He knows our thoughts are far off. He knows everything we're thinking, everything we're purposing. He knows every time we doubt. He knows every time we chuckle in our heart. He knows every time we praise him. He, he knows all these things. And he knows when we're afraid. And he knows when we lie. So as we go forward into verse 16, a somewhat, I don't want to really call it a transition, but um, I guess you could call it that. But we see that the Lord appeared with two angels, and they stopped by Abraham's tent on their way. They're going to fulfill a mission. They have a mission at this point in time, and it's to walk towards Sodom and Gomorrah, to pour out judgment upon these wicked nations. Now, if you remember, we talked about Sodom and Gomorrah back in Genesis 14. It's when there was the northern invasion to the eastern kings. We had Chedorlaomer coming down attacking Sodom and Gomorrah and their other buddies. And essentially they got wiped out. Chedorlaomer and Amor took Lot captive. And that's why God put his blessing upon Abraham's life to go retrieve Lot. So he goes into with 318 servants and wipes out Chedorlaomer. And Amor. And at the end of the day, Sodom, the king of Sodom, Bara, which means the evil one, he was delivered from the Lord. He didn't lose his life. He had to reestablish his kingdom. And you'd think after God did all of that, after he revealed himself to these wicked people, that they would repent and live for the living God. But they don't. Instead, they go into a direction, and they end up in a condition that was not, that is now worse than it was before. And so again, we have to realize that God is merciful, God is gracious, God is kind, God is loving, but there's a time when that has to be on pause, and God needs to pour out judgment. The iniquity of Sodom and Gomorrah is getting full. And God needs to pour out his wrath. So that's what's going to take place here as we move into verse 16. It says in verse 16, Then the men rose from there and looked towards Sodom. And Abraham went there, uh, went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him, in order that he might command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grave, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me, and if not, I will know. So as Abraham, this was part of that culture for hospitality, Abraham was walking uh, these men out, the Lord and two angels. And the Lord asks a question, probably loud enough for Abraham to hear, I'm sure. But he said, shall I hide Ab from Abraham what I am doing? And should I let Abraham know, should I inform him about the judgment that's going to take place upon Sodom and Gomorrah? But if he sees, he asks this question, we're going to see that God does reveal all this stuff to Abram, uh, Abraham. So in verse 19, he says, for I have known him. I mean, that, that, that well, I have known him. This is, this is calling him this intimate friend. I've known him in his capacity. And it says he put in order all that I commanded him. He put his children and his household in order. We saw that in Genesis chapter 17 with all the circumcision. God saw that Abraham was a man of God, 
God saw that Abraham was willing to walk by the Spirit and to be a leader and to lead his people, his, his, his children, his children's children, and his descendants all in the ways of the Lord, to teach them righteousness, to teach them justice, to know that the Lord is fair and just. You see, if Abraham one day woke up and saw that Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed, perhaps Abraham would have began to question the Lord and said, well, Lord, what was your heart in this? I don't understand. Did you destroy the righteous or the wicked? I don't really even know what happened. And is that what happened, Lord? Do you have unjust weights and measures? What's your nature? What's your character, Lord? So here the Lord wants to reveal to Abraham what he's doing, that Abraham will have a greater understanding of God's character and God's nature and God's heart. That God will always deliver the righteous from the wicked. And that's what this whole last portion we're going to be covering is all about. So it says in verse 20, I mean verse uh, 22, Then the men turned away from there, so the two angels, and they went towards Sodom, and we're going to see in 19, they're the ones that are going to judge it, of course, through um, God's calling. But, um, I lost my place, sorry. And they went towards Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. And so he's hanging back with God. In verse 23, And Abraham came near and said, Would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, we don't know exactly in what way the Lord manifested himself, right, physically, what he clothed himself with when he, when he showed himself to Abraham. We don't know what exactly that looked like, but it wasn't scary. It was, he was able to come before the Lord and to plead and to beg and to beg God to have mercy upon Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to get more into that in a moment. But, you know, I believe that's why Jesus came in the way he did. He came in the likeness of man that you and I wouldn't be afraid to approach him. To approach the living God. And he's about to plead with God. And it convicts my heart. Because I can honestly say, I do not plead for our nation as much as I should. I mean, we see the things going on in our world today. We should know better to be interceding for our nation and the condition. But, but this is who Abraham was. We're going to see from like basically this verse forward to the end of this chapter. It's Abraham just having this communion, having this this prayer life, having this intercessory prayer life with God. And he just puts his heart all out there, and he goes back and forth between him and God. But Abraham knew that Lot was in Sodom. Abraham knew that Lot's family was in Sodom. And he loves Lot. Abraham loves Lot. So he's going to pray for him, but he's going to pray to God on the basis of who God is. He knows it's not in God's character and nature to destroy the righteous from the wicked. So he's going to begin to beg and say, God, be merciful towards the righteous. Please deliver them. And God will. We'll, we'll see that. But, but this whole scene here that we're going to be, that's going to develop, it, it's a picture of what's to come. That there is a global event coming to a theater near you called the Great Tribulation. It's God pouring out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting world. It's heaven pouring judgment down upon a man. But right here, it's going to tell us that God will deliver the righteous and the wicked. Right here in Genesis 18. Now I say this because there are many people who believe the church is currently in the Great Tribulation period. <laughs> no. And now I know there are many views to the Tribulation. There's pre-Tribulation and mid-Tribulation. There's post-tribulation. And there's solid evidence to all of them. But what I do want to emphasize here is more so the pre-tribulation view. Because that's exactly what we're seeing here. We're seeing God deliver the righteous before he pours out judgment upon the wicked. You know, because I, I, I can't help but to think, the church that God bought for that God bought with a price, right? God paid for the bride with his blood. I just don't see him wanting to pour out wrath upon what he has just bought with his blood. But again, we, I think the Bible plainly teaches that before God pours out his wrath in the great tribulation period, he's going to take the church away. And that day is coming when the Lord will remove the church. You know, today our, our world is such an upheaval state, but guess what? It's the Holy Spirit that's holding our world together right now. How? Through the church. 
Right now, we have sinners running around the streets aimlessly, doing whatever they think is right in their own eyes, walking in freedom. But that, that freedom is going to come to an end, and that's when God removes the church and then pours out his wrath upon our place rejecting world. You know, even if we were to look at Genesis 19, chapter 22, when the angels say, it says, Harding escaped there, as into the land of Zor, for I cannot do anything until you arrive there. You see, the angel is telling Lot, his wife, and their two daughters, you need to get out of here because when you do, then we can pour out judgment. We can't do anything until after you escape. So again, after God moves the church, he raptures us. The Lamb of God is going to pour out his wrath upon this Christ rejected world. So in verse 24, Suppose there were 50 righteous within the city. So at this point, we're going to see him begin to bargain with the Lord. <laughs> Will you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. I just love <laughs> Abraham's relationship he has with the Lord. Telling God, far be it from you, you would never do such a thing, right? You would never destroy the righteous from the wicked, right, Lord? Far be it from you. And he says, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And that's exactly who Jesus is. He's the judge of all the earth. And of course he'll do that. He's going to judge the earth. He's going to judge every person individually. And he's going to do it with perfection. We may think we know how God should judge, but that is not true. God knows how to judge. He knows. He is the perfect judge, and he will do right, even when sometimes our minds tell us he did wrong. In verse 26, So the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare it for the place uh, for the place where they are saved. Then Abraham answered and said, Indeed now, I am, but, I am but dust and ashes, I take it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose there were five less than fifty righteous. Would you destroy all the city for lack of five? So he said, If I find there forty-five, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, Suppose there should be forty found there. So he said, I will do it, I will not do it for the sake of forty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak, suppose thirty should be found there. So he said, I will do, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Indeed now I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord, suppose twenty should be found there. So God said, I will not destroy it for the sake of twenty. Then he said, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak but once more. Suppose ten should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of ten. No. <laughs> this is, again, super cultural. If you go to Israel today and you walk into a shop, and you ask the shop owner, Hey, how much for this? You're going to get yourself into a long conversation. Oh. A long conversation of bargaining. What they're going to do is say, I don't know, $100. And then it's going to be your job to throw out this ridiculously low offer and say, how about two bucks? <laughs> mm -hmm. And they're going to, ah, how about 90? How about five? How about 80? How about 20? How about five? I'll meet you at 30. Boom, you get up to 30. But listen, my point is here if you go, if you walk away from the shop without engaging that conversation, they're actually going to be offended because that's just the way the culture is. Mm -hmm. it's, it's your job to buy into this. And what I'm seeing here is, is here's Abraham speaking with the Lord, and he's slowly lowering number. Right? 50, you get it by 4, you have 30, you got 20, you take on once, take on twice, so, right? And he gets it down. And Abraham's like, certainly there must be 10 righteous in the city of Sodom. There must be. I mean, you have Lot, you have his wife, you have your two unmarried daughters, you have your two sons, and then you have your two uh, daughters who are married. That's 10, right? Aren't they all righteous? I think, Lord, I mean, I haven't seen them in a while, but I think they're righteous. Will you still save the city for those ten? We're going to see that there's not ten righteous within the city of Sodom. There's only going to be four that get delivered. But it's amazing to me the scene because Abraham thinks he's bargaining with the Lord. But to the Lord, in his perspective, he's just simply communing with his son Abraham. And he's loving 
probably rejoiced when he heard Abraham say these words. What about ten, Lord? What about ten? Did you say that I said ten, Lord? I'm sure there was that proud father moment saying, Yes, son. That's exactly where I want your heart. You know, Jesus has a heart for intercessory prayer. Jesus wants us to have that heart too. To intercede. It says in verse 33, or concluding verse, So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking. That word in Hebrew is communing. He was communing with Abraham. And Abraham returned to his place. So Abraham just got done intercessory, interceding. And his prayer was effective, his prayer was personal, his prayer was consistent. And he just constantly prayed and prayed and prayed. And looking at this story, it should cut us to the heart. With just how consistent he is with prayer. Just going before the Lord in prayer. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to pray. You know, we're not to write sinners off when they're lost. But we're to go to battle for them and pray for them. And I understand what it means to pray and not get the results you're looking for. You can lose heart very easily. But just picture Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying as he's, the Father's telling him to go to the cross and saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. But he said, Lord, if this cup could pass for me, please, right? Let this cup pass for me. But if not, your will be done. He just left it. The Lord, you know, Jesus had his desire. He didn't want to go to the cross. He was in flesh. That, that's terrible. It's the most excruciating way to die. But Lord, this is the result I'd rather see. But I trust your will. If you plan to do the cross, I will. You know, and that's what Abraham's doing here. He's praying on behalf of the city of Sodom for not to get destroyed. And he gets down to 10, and then he places it in the Lord's hands and says, okay, Lord, I trust you. Whatever the outcome is of what I just prayed, it's fine. I trust you. I trust your plan. So, guys, we need to be praying. And I know people never want to listen to Christians talk, especially when they're lost sinners. They don't want to hear anything they have to say. But if you can't reach them physically, I want you to know that God can reach them through your prayer life. That we are to chase sinners with prayers. Follow sinners. With prayers. And we should never let one perish for the lack of our supplication. We have a duty, a God given duty, to pray for the lost and for the weak and for the hurt and for the broken. That's something we need to do always. You know, and I, I know parents who pray for their children saying, Lord, would you just save them? And you know, I mean, they end up going to prison and they're like, God, what was that? You know? <laughs> it's like, well, that was God answering. Now God has a captive audience or sitting in a prison cell alone with the Lord, and they get saved there. The Lord knows what he's doing, even when you don't get the results of the prayer that you think you should have. Again, it's the Lord who is the judge of all the earth who does right. He will answer our prayers accordingly and rightly, according to his will. So chapter 19 next week, and we'll be looking at uh, the condition of Sodom right before it's destroyed. It's going to be very inhumane, carnal, twisted, perverted, unmoral. We're going to see some things. We're going to see church. Uh, we pray for your blessing upon every individual here, every individual that's walk, watching online. Lord, would you meet them where they're at, just trusting you? God, and may you just give them the hunger to want to spend time with you. And Lord, as we spend time with you, you'll appear to us, you'll visit us, you'll give us revelation, you'll give us understanding, you'll give us wisdom. You'll give us the things we need to get through those cloudy days, to get through those days that are foggy, those days that make no sense, those days that are hurting. Uh, just, God, just be with us. Be with us, Lord. And God, we want to serve you. We want to spend time with you. God, you say, you stand at the door of our heart and knock. And if we open it, you will come in and dine with us. Lord, would you dine with us? Would you dine with us this evening? So, Lord, may you be with every person here and with everything they're going through. God, we're limitless, but you are limited. God, 
God will have your way.